Hey everybody, I'm Chili. Welcome back to Beginner C++ Tutorial 4, Part 2. Continuing on from Part 1, we're going to learn about classes, objects, and member variables. And then using these concepts, we're going to change our code so that we can keep track of the reticle position between frames, allowing us to freely move it across the goddamn screen. Alright, so classes and objects. Uh, I mean, they're a super important part of the C++ language, as well as Java, C Sharp, Python and a whole bunch of others. Uh, you know, we call all of these languages, we call them object-oriented languages. That's a big hint that, you know, maybe objects are kind of a big deal. Now, I'm going to be giving an overview of classes and objects, what they are and how they do. But we're not going to go balls deep today. It's just a tip for right now. Don't sweat the small details or worried about some unanswered questions. That shit will come in future lessons. Now you guys already have some experience with objects, so let's start there. Uh, you've been dealing with the graphics object, right? That's what you use to call put pixel. You call put pixel on the graphics object, and that puts a pixel onto the screen. And after that, you learned about the Windows object. The Windows object contains the keyboard object, and it's on the keyboard object that we call this function, and that gets us the state of the keyboard. We can check whether any particular key is being pressed. So objects represent some aspect or some entity in our system, just some thing in our software system. So graphics represents the screen, the graphics of our program. Window represents the window, and inside of the window we have the keyboard because keyboard input is handled through the window in Windows. Objects represent the things in our system and we can do operations on them and get information from them. So what about classes then? Well, a common analogy is that classes are like cookie cutters. Uh, they determine the shape of the cookies that are made with them. Objects are the cookies and you create those cookies by stamping cookie cutters in the dough. So writing class is creating a blueprint that we can use then to create one or more objects of that class type. Uh, and this is generally done in .h files. So let's go from game.cpp to game.h and see what that looks like. And here it is. Here is a class uh, declaration or a class specification, whatever you want to call it. This is where we tell the, uh, the compiler what the game class is. We give it the shape of the cookie cutter. Now, like I said, classes only define the shape of an object. Uh, you still have to create the object itself, also known as an instance of the class. Think about it, just because you made a cookie cutter doesn't mean you're going to have some good eats. You're going to be one hungry mofo if you don't actually use that cookie cutter to make some goddamn cookies. So let's go back to main.cpp because that's where it all starts really. That's where the program starts. And here, if you ignore this try stuff, here you see where the main objects are being created. Here, we're creating an object called wind and the type of that object is a main window. And then we're creating object the game and its type is a type of game. So here we create the window and we create the game objects. And then we do the game loop in here, right? And you might say, well, Chili, what about motherfucking graphics? I mean, we use that shit all the time. Motherfucking put pixel. Where is the graphics? Show me the graphics. Well, uh, graphics isn't created in here. It's actually part of the game object. So if we go to game.h, which tells us what the game class, the cookie cutter is, we see that the game objects they embed a graphics object. So there's a graphics object built into every game object. And when you create a game object, that will create a graphics object automatically because it's built inside there. If we go to game.cpp and we look up here, we can see here is where it is actually constructed in this special function called a constructor. Uh, but again, that's a story for another day. We'll talk about constructors later on. Now, if you look back at main.cpp, uh, you see we're creating one window object and we're creating one game object. And inside of game, there is one graphics object. So you might think, you know, okay, so every 
class, you create one object, but that's not the case. You can create many, many objects of the same class, just like with a cookie cutter, you can punch out hundreds of cookies if you want. Uh, it just so happens that right now we're only creating one uh, instance of every class or one object. But later on in like tutorial 9, we're going to start creating multiple objects of a single class. Alright, so how do classes actually define objects? How do they define their shape? Uh, they do this by specifying the members of the object. And there are two kinds of members. There are data members and there are function members or member functions, we usually say. Now, data members, you can think of them like the physical parts of the object. Uh, so, for example, game, it has built into it, inside of it, there is a graphics object. Uh, it's just like if in a human, we are human, right? Probably. Um, and embedded in you, there are two objects of type kidney and two objects of type eye and one of type heart etc etc and it's the same idea for uh, objects in C++ they can have embedded in them objects that make them up uh, parts like a, a car can have in, embedded into it an engine uh, that's one way of thinking about it but it it could be something simpler, like you could have a human object and inside of the human object you will have uh, a data member int age and that tells you the age of the human, for example. So we can think of data members as either the components that make up the object or you can think of it as, you know, variables that describe the object. They keep track of the object's state or its properties. Just a quick aside here, uh, this one here, you might think this also oh, game uh, embeds or has built into it a window, but that's not true. This ampersand here means something special. This means this is a reference. So window isn't actually built into game. This is like a remote control so that game can access the window object. Window isn't actually inside of game. It's not in its belly, but game has a remote control. It's got it's got window on speed dial. It can you can call that shit for you know a booty call anytime it wants. Basically, tap that sweet keyboard. So that's data members. What about member functions? Well, member functions they define the behaviors of the object or the operations that can be performed on the objects. Uh, so for example, this member function here is a special one, it's called the constructor, and it basically gives the process of, you know, what code is to be executed when we create a game object. And here we've got the go function, and this one is the one you call every frame in uh, main.cpp to process a frame of the game, that's the main game loop function. Uh, so you got go here, and then uh, we've got compose frame and update model, and we, we'll talk about this one a little later. A compose frame is where we actually draw the game frame that's going to be shown to the user. All of our coding up until this point has been confined to the compose frame function inside of here. Uh, later on in this tutorial, we are going to write code inside of update model as well. And later on still in tutorial 6, we are going to create new member functions inside of game and then write them. Alright, let's talk a little bit more about these .h files and these .cpp files. What the fuck is this bullshit? Well, uh, H stands for header. We call the H files header files. And CPP, uh, we call these source files. And basically, we, def we divide up the code that we write into these two kinds of files. Uh, now, you may have noticed a bit of symmetry here. We've got game.h and we got game.cpp. We got graphics.cpp. We got, uh, where is it? graphics.h. We got mainwindow.cpp. We got mainwindow.h. There's, for every, in general, for every header file, it has a corresponding source file. And the way it works is the header file 
basically sketches out the class. Like I said before, it specifies what members there are of the class. It gives us the shape of the class, what behaviors it has, and what data it has. And then the CPP file, this is where you actually give the, uh, the code for those behaviors, the steps that will be carried out when these behaviors are activated, when these functions are called. So if you put those side by side on the same screen, it looks something like this. You've got game.h, and here is where the class is defined, where it's specified what things are going to be in a game object. And then for every one of these functions, for these member functions of game, you've got an entry in game.cpp that says, okay, this is what happens in this function. This is what happens in Go. In Go, we call update model and we call compose frame and a bunch of other shit. And in compose frame, uh, which is declared in game.h, this is what happens in compose frame. So game.cpp is giving you basically the scripts for these functions that were first declared in game.h. One more thing I'd like you to notice is that inside of the, uh, the functions for game, we can call or access other members of game. So inside of game go, we can call game update model and that will call this function and then we call compose frame and that will call this function and we can access the uh, the reference to the window and we can access the graphics object so inside of these functions for game we can access any of games members now, I know what you're saying. You're probably saying, well, that's real nifty chili, but how is this going to help us escape from our Groundhog Day nightmare, our repeating situation where we can never get out of our position for X and Y? We can't remember where we were last frame. We always lose this information. And what I say to you is, well, sure, if we put these member variables in the compose frame function, they're created at the beginning and they're destroyed at the end and they get reset every single frame. But here's the thing. What if we were to move these variables from here into the member variables for the game object. So now they're not local variables inside of this function. They're member variables for the game object. We're gonna have int x and int y in here. And when we do that, they, are, they will now live for as long as the game object lives. And if you remember, going back to main.cpp, we see that the game is created here and it is going to live for as long as the game runs. It lives for as long as this loop goes. And then when we leave this scope, it gets destroyed. So any member variables of the game are going to live as long as the game is running until the end of the program. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move the uh, creation of these variables from the local function scope into the member variable scope. And then when we access them like this, when we do x equals x plus 100, we're going to be accessing this member variable. We're going to be changing its value. And that value is going to be, it's going to remain alive between subsequent frame calls, between subsequent compose frames. It's going to remember its previous value. And that's going to allow us to move shit around on the screen. Pretty fucking tight, if you ask me. So let's do that shit. Well, first things first, let's go into game.h. So I'll just, I put a little section in here just for you to put your member variables in. I made it special for you. So all you gotta do is you go int x and let's give it an initial value of 400 and int y is equal to 300. So now we've created these member variables and now that's what our code is gonna be accessing, those member variables. So let's build this shit and then run it. And now we should be able to move our reticle, and no, it's still doing the same shit. Well, what the fuck? Well, here's the thing, and I've already, I've told you about this already, so maybe you can already f figure out what the problem is, but here, we're creating local variables x and y, but there are already x and y variables 
in game. So what's happening now? Well, it's the same idea as when you create X here and then you create another X at a higher scope. The higher scope X will cover up the lower scope one. So when we create this X and Y, this local X and Y, what it's doing is it's covering up this X and Y. And now when we add to X, we're adding to this one, this one remains untouched. So we can't, obviously we don't want to do this. This is not a good idea. So we get rid of that. And also, one more thing that we could probably fix right now. Adding 100 pixels per frame is going to move our cursor way too fast. That's going to be... Because 60 frames is 6,000 pixels per second. So let's m move the speed down to 3 pixels per frame. That's still a fairly decent speed, I think, but it's going to be a little more controllable. So now if we run this and we press the arrow keys, now we fucking move in our cursor around the goddamn screen. Isn't that just like fucking sweet? Because I think yeah, that is a pretty good. My name is Jeff. Um, I'm working on that. Just uh, come back to me later. Uh, so yeah, now we can fucking move shit. We can remember we have we have escaped the curse of the Alzheimer's variables and we can now remember what we did last frame where we were and we can move on from that point pretty goddamn good just a quick note for you guys if you try to move the reticle off the screen to the left or to the right you'll see it kind of wraps around like this but if you move it down too far to the bottom you crash your program uh and that behavior, I'm going to talk about that in tutorial 5, so don't worry about it right now. Just, you know, don't go off the screen for now, and I'll talk about that a little more in tutorial 5. But that's it for part 2. Stay tuned for part 3, where I give you guys some more practical examples of working with member variables, we explore more sophisticated ways of controlling the reticle, and we learn how to separate our game logic from our drawing code. If you have any questions about this video, leave a comment or visit us on the forum or the Discord. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps out a lot. And I will see you soon with some more C++.